Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you might be. Today is, uh, what is it, September 14th, 2023. And mm -hmm. um, we're here today, we'll work for food, the new possibilities hour. As you know, this uh, is a program that is near and dear to the hearts of Natalie Armstrong Motan, who was the brainchild of it, and Jeff Kachavin and I, who co moderate each week with um, an amazing colleague who agrees to speak, all in the interests of uh, raising money for food banks. So there is no charge. We just ask that you make a donation if you're able in any amount to a food bank, either the one that the speaker suggests or your local food bank, one of your preference. And then if you'd be so kind as to let Natalie know or Jeff or, or myself let us know, and we'll be happy to add it to our running total, you know, however much the donation is. So thank you for your generosity. How much is that running total right now, Jeff? Where are we? Thank you, Jean. I'm delighted to report our audiences have been so very generous in terms of contributing in honor of our great speakers. <laughs> Since we began the series, our audiences have contributed the magnificent sum of 441000 $991.78 to our audiences and our speakers. Thank you so much. Back to you, Jean. Even that 78 cents will buy a couple of meals at some of the from some of the uh, food banks with their buying power. That's just fantastic. We're looking at coming up on 450,000, which is, you know, four and a half million or more, five million meals, depending on the buying power of the food bank. And, uh, Half a million, here we come. So thank you so much. And let's get to it now today. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Deborah Dupree. She's going to speak to us on why aren't they listening? How to create change in a disputant's mindset. And I had the privilege of listening to um, Deborah, Dr. <laughs> Dupree, uh, speak at an employment conference a couple of weeks ago, and it was just fascinating. And so I'm sure we're in for a real treat. She is a dispute resolution master, a, a conflict coach, a mindset doctor, and international trainer and keynote speaker. She's the host of the bi-weekly podcast, Decoding the Conflicted Mind or the Conflict Mindset, bringing thought leaders um, throughout various disciplines uh, and teaching them about how to engage with their self and others through difficult conversations and negotiations. She's trained throughout North America, Australia, India, the Pacific Rim in workplace mediation, advanced strategies for dispute resolution professionals and leadership uh, strategies for the work world. And she currently serves on the Southern California Mediation Association Board of Directors and the Employment Mediation Panel and is on the faculty for various American Arbitration Association programs. So it's a real treat to have you here, Deborah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your food bank, which is the Maui Food Bank, and the um, link will be in the chat, and then the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jean and Natalie and Jeff. Uh, it's a delightful to be here, and uh, I'm really honored to be asked to, to be here. Um, you know, we were just talking before everybody came on that we have lots of world tragedies going on right now. And so when when we started making arrangements for this, you know, Maui was first on my mind um, because of the recency of it. But I think many of us can probably say at some point in our life, we probably have been to Maui and Lahaina. And so uh, it touches the nerve. It's been many years since I've been there. But, you know, knowing that I've been there, um, you know, the, the heartbreak and the, the losses uh, are even more relevant. And I just felt that it was a very timely uh, food bank to contribute to. And so I encourage everyone to, to reach out. But we also talked about uh, Morocco and we also talked about Libya. And so, you know, more to come, unfortunately, um, that we have to do this in this kind of set setting. But uh, thank you for being here, everyone. I look forward to a hopefully an exciting program this morning. Okay. Well, you know, as um, and thank you, Jean, for the, that introduction. And you know, I sort of come into mediation from a slightly different background than a lot of uh, my colleagues. Um, while I've studied law, I never became a lawyer, but I've taught law school in ADR. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer. I come from a psychology background. And my own, you know, personal story of my family upbringing is what led to my fascination with human dynamics and particularly people in conflict. 
And so it was only later after I got into my career that I really realized some of those early influences that shaped my 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 career choices and my career paths. And um, uh, and so I always found it so interesting that how can such nice, educated people be in such conflict? And so I really uh, dove into understanding what is uh, the, the conflict mindset and how do we redirect it? And so what I hope to share with you are some key thoughts of things I've learned. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you that you're getting a little uh, snippets of my recent TEDx talk uh, when I talked about um, we're talking, but are we really communicating and uh, taking a look at that. And I'm I have hopefully one of our programs, Words Matter, how to keep the courtroom lingo out of the mediation room uh, is, is hopefully coming up too. So it's about how do we influence. And so let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll get going. Uh, a few things about um, my my premises here is that um, we our world has changed phenomenally. You know, particularly with COVID coming in, and we you know certainly see you know the impact of of, of mental health and, and well being at work and at home and our communities. And so here's really an opportunity to really take a personal look at our own mindset as we come into our profession, come into the world of work of mediation, and just how do we more articulately and effectively identify people's needs, but then also have the te techniques to redirect them, to change their mindset about how they're thinking about their dispute or their conflict. And so, as it says here, same old thinking, guess what? You get the same old results. And so again, I look at uh, conflict as being uh, not an adverse thing to avoid, but instead an opportunity. Where can we go with this now? And so that's sort of the foundation of some of my thinking. And so when we look at this, I'm going to tell you just a brief on the brain. I thought our, our, our churning mediators would like that little word, a brief on the brain. And so uh, a few things to keep in mind. People actually come into a mediation already, in a way, agitated because they're they're having to deal with their conflict that's probably been with them for a while. They're they're maybe never been in mediation before, and so they're already sort of in a heightened sense, uh, state of anxiety. And so from the very get go, and I would I'm a strong advocate of pre mediation, so I use my pre mediation sessions to prepare the person to get them into a better mindset for the actual mediation. But going back to the brain science, you know, it's that basic drive to survive, our, our fight, flight, freeze. And now we've learned fawn. People give in too easily to try to put the conflict behind them. And so this is natural. It's been with us at the beginning of humankind, and our bodies are still largely wired the same way. Our threats today are vastly different from the days of running from di dinosaurs and tyrannosauruses. Uh, but the, they're real to us, and we react accordingly. And so we uh, we also know that emotions will come up, oftentimes triggered, not necessarily, well, they may be triggered in the current moment, but they actually have their foundation in past moments. And particularly if we take a look at our childhood experiences, um, we know and understand the nature of trauma much more significantly today even when, then when I went to graduate school 30 years ago. And so this is where the neuroscience is so fascinating and, and where I really chose to spend my doctorate studies on to better understand going deeper into the, this emotional reaction. And so you, we probably all can identify with that, you know, that, that pit in my stomach, you know, or um, my rapid heartbeat or my shallow breathing, or maybe just a brain freeze. Those are all signs of the physiological responses that people are feeling. And so what happens is that, you know, our brain is really an organ, just like any part of our, any other part of our body. It just happens to house our mind where we have cognitive thoughts and we have emotional experiences. And so when we're triggered, there's a whole physiological response going on. And therefore it interrupts what's happening in the brain, interrupts how we can get past the emotional experience into the cognitive realm where we have decision making. And when we experience different kinds of emotions, we actually, it leads to different kinds of, of decision-making as well. So as you can see here, anger tends to lead to more impatient or rash decision-making. Sadness or fear may be clouded by uncertainty and caution. And then and think about the, the clients that you work with who 
just can't seem to make a decision. They're oftentimes stuck in this, this fear pattern uh, or excited. They may be really quick to make decisions then out of excitement because they see it, an opportunity for resolution. And so again, all of this is sort of happening behind the scenes, so to speak. And so I want to just show you a couple of slides that really sort of tap into what's going on and how can we pay attention? I, I hear a lot that, particularly as we transition to the virtual platform, I can't read the body language. And it's like, well, actually, there's a lot of things if you know what to look for, you can. And so, I mean, just even looking at this, this picture of the eye, I mean, you can see it's inflamed, right? There's stuff going on. The, so we see that the, the eyes are a roaring fire. The eyebrows are arched like an arrow. The temples are beating. You can even see that with our clients. Uh, the muscles in their cheeks may be flexing. And inside, they, they may be having this rapid heartbeat and, and having difficulty catching their breath. And so I like to say the brain is a, is a cacophony, not a symphony. It's not orchestrated. It's just happening randomly and disruptively. And so with that, there's a few things um, I want to point out, again, from a neurochemical standpoint in, in terms of what triggers people in conflict. And um, I may imagine a lot of you may be familiar with the work of Daniel Coleman. If not, uh, he's considered sort of the modern day father of emotional intelligence. And he, for many years, he's called it the amygdala hijack. Well, having studied in psychology at the advanced level, it's always sort of confused me because I've read his books and it's like, why did he call it the amygdala hijack? Because that's just part of it. And so it's interesting because he's still alive and well and regularly posts on LinkedIn. LinkedIn and so somebody I would encourage you to follow. Uh, but I think it was um, sometime over the winter of 2023 that he made a post. He goes, I had it all wrong. It's not the amygdala hijack. It's really the emotional hijack because there's a a series of different brain uh, components that go on in this emotional intensity or emotional response. So just from a neurochemical standpoint, um, we first get activated with adrenaline at the base of our brain. And I'll go into this a little bit more you know, tangibly. And so what does adrenaline do? It charges us up. It gets us going. And so that could be good or bad. And then it goes into what we call the limbic brain. And this is where we emit cortisol, which is one of our stress responses. And depending upon the person's past experiences and depending upon the intensity of the situation, we can actually experience what is a psychological term called flooding, where we have so much cortisol that's being emitted in our limbic brain that it impedes the neural pathways necessary to get to the prefrontal cortex, which is where we are humans up here, where we can think and analyze and, and be cognitive and make decisions and we're calmer, et cetera. So this initial reaction actually can shut down our neural pathways to good decision-making. So what happens? People become disoriented. They may get confused. Their ability to make decisions disappears. Uh, they're unable to hear and listen to different perspectives that might be presented in a mediation session. Um, they're, they're, they almost become so focused that they can't see the bigger picture. And, um, and they tend to be very reactive in the moment. And so the, 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 the good news I bring to you, but also not so good news, is that when we have this kind of intense um, psychobiological, neurochemical kind of reaction going on with the brain in a conflict mindset, it can literally take up to as much as 24 to 72 hours for the physiology to settle back down into that pre-triggered state. And so timing is everything, folks. Um, and that's why it might actually, I remember the days of where we'd almost, you know, reach resolution by starvation, you know, where we'd go for, you know, ad nauseum long days. And I remember one difficult mediation I did a few years ago, pre-COVID, we were actually there until nine o'clock on a Friday night. We had Washington, D.C. still on the hook, uh, in, you know, making the final decision. We'd been there all day. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, I could see, well, that we sort of wore them down, is sort of what we did. Um, and where we may have benefited, say, okay, here's what we, where we are right now, and let's come back to this. And so I want you to keep that in mind. Follow-up is really important. Checking back in with people. People generally, I would say about 50% of the population generally needs time to think through their decisions and their experiences. And so I, I use a lot around communication styles as well. So this is just some of what's happening biochemically in our brains. And so 
uh, there's a ton of research going on out there right now. Um, I was excited to speak at a physician's conference last fall. And um, and so I had so many questions from doctors not knowing all this stuff, but Stanford's one of the leaders, Rutgers, of course, Harvard. And, um, and so really taking a look at, again, how does this whole neurobiological, physiological um, experience play in? And in the figure, it may be a little hard to see on the screen, but what happens unless we develop what I call more of our emotional intelligence, which is self-awareness, self-management, other awareness, and relationship management, we can get short-circuited uh, in the limbic brain, which is marked by the thalamus there. So you can see where the arrow is going up, and then it sort of loops back really quickly and, and triggering with the, the amygdala. Instead, we want to learn to pause in those triggered moments and help our clients pause in those moments so the neuropathy can actually get up to the the what's called the frontal cortex or the prefrontal cortex, which is way up here. That's our human intelligence brain. We're the only species that has that. And so that's where we want to learn how to pace and time things and be aware, pay attention to some of those physical reactions we see going on in people's faces, particularly their faces, um, but it can also demonstrate itself in other parts of the body. And so just looking at these pictures, I mean, you can see a change of expression and they reflect different emotions. Wouldn't you agree? We want to move somebody who may be all the way to the left or maybe the second one worried and you know anxious about what's going on and get them to the point of where they start relaxing and they can actually, you know, for the lack of a better word right now, have fun through the experience of being courageous and curious to learn where's the other person coming from when we're in uh, a dispute resolution process when we're in conflict. And um, Foking, uh, I had a guest speaker in my podcast just earlier this week who talked about, you know, I don't refer to it as resolution anymore. Instead, I talk about bringing closure to the conflict that exists between you know two parties, however many that might be. And I really thought that was a nice way to reframe uh, because we may not necessarily resolve things, but we can bring closure to the conflict that brings them to mediation. And so um, you'll probably be seeing that in uh, our next work with Harold Coleman on uh, Words Matter. Um, and so the words that we use in mediation, either by the mediator or the advocates, as well as the parties, can actually fuel this, these neuropsychological, biological, chemical reactions just by the words that we use. And so that's why we talk about Words Matter. And so we know, I mean, back in the day when I went to graduate school, there wasn't much attention given to feelings, even though I was in psychology. Uh, we really talked about cognitions, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, and it works. But what we now know with the neuroscientific background is that uh, those kinds of changes don't tend to be as long term. But if we now focus on the emotional aspects preceding our cognitions, we tend to, to be successful in longer term outcomes. And so, you know, it's basically... Uh, identifying underlying interests as opposed to identifying you know, solutions uh, too quickly. And if we know what we're looking for, we can really glean a lot of information from those emotional displays. And this sort of goes back to what I said already. Keep in mind, our clients are coming in already bothered, disturbed, anxious, whatever that might be. They already have an emotional presence going on for them. And so again, our demeanor, our presence, as I know you know, makes such a difference. And I'll explain that in just a moment too. Now, as said in the write-up, I was going to introduce you to 10 common triggers and 12 cognitive distortions. For the interest of time, I'm just gonna to touch on this lightly, but I, in my later slide, I do provide you with a link. I've completed a series of short videos, like just two or three minutes, on the 12 cognitive distortions, so you can dive into that and know how to redirect that, because that really underlies a lot of the mindset that um, that people bring into the mediation session and gives you some ideas about how to how to change that, how to shift that mindset. But this, um, and I also have a series of, um, in the process of being released on the 10 triggers. And again, these are oftentimes underlying factors that may be driving people in, uh, considering what options might exist. 
And these triggers are oftentimes linked to those past memories, those past experiences. And so if we can identify, you know, what's happening for somebody and ask questions around this, then we have the opportunity to reframe them. So for example, um, you know, rejection, well, actually, what is somebody really looking for? Acceptance or approval. Or let's say somebody is, um, uh, you know, feeling um, challenged beliefs. Well, it could be that, you know, they're, they don't feel that their perspective is being considered or regarded. And so that's where we want to help them, you know, find voice. Well, what? And I talk about perspectives, not positions. Uh, perspectives is, uh, this is how I see it. How do you see it? And then what can we learn from each other about that? So this is an opportunity for you to actually reframe these. And that's what my, my video series will talk about. Um, uh, normally what I'd like to do is break you all into groups and have you practice with that and see, you know, uh, learn from each other as far as how to reframe that. But that's what we want to do, just like our, you know, reframing is one of our most valuable techniques that we have. And so uh, this is an opportunity to, to give you something to focus on specifically. And again, this is not my findings. I've, I've used this through my research and uh, applied it to um, the practice of mediation. And so our, I look at um, we as mediators, as influencers, influencers for positive change. And that's where then our techniques for how we achieve that becomes so important. Well, asking open-ended questions or reframing the negative triggers to positive needs and redirecting from confrontations to learning conversations to uncover what's important to others. And so those are key points that I, I really wanted to emphasize here. And with that, then I, I want to just share with you when we talk about the changing world, um, you know, sort of what's going on um, based on some recent stats. So I, I do mostly employment mediation. And so what's going on there and right now, EEOC is very hot with some major decisions um, coming out, particularly around medical conditions in the workplace, which is another one of my niche markets. Um, but as it says here, you know, the current pandemic is not just a public health crisis, it's an economic and a civil rights crisis. And I'll show you some stats shortly, but as it says here, you know, the COVID-19 and economic fallout has, has, you know, affected certain segments of the population more so than others. And these actually line up with the uh, seven protected characteristics under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And so um, it, 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 it does come up. And so what's these are the different kinds of the discrimination or um, types of discrimination claims that people may file. And um, what I have learned uh, over my 20 plus years of being a senior mediator in the Department of Navy that yes, we have that, it's, it's very clear, the seven protected classes under Title VII, but when you really dive deeper into what's driving people uh, around those claims, it often breaks down into people differences. Um, but we all have these, these all protected rights. And so it's easy to, to put a claim under that. But when you break it down, it really gets into communication, uh, relationship building, and, and how our individual styles play out. And that's led to some of the development of how I approach mediation and working with clients. And, and what I try to bring to some of the teachings um, that I, I do through the ABA and uh, the AAA and some of the other work that I'm doing. I'm excited. I'm actually going to be speaking with, working with a, a legal group in India uh, where I've done some work before and uh, uh, talking about the psychology of conflict as part of a series. And I'll share with you this little story. When I first started teaching ADR for um, Cal Western School of Law in San Diego back in 2007 or eight. Uh, my first couple of years of uh, teaching ADR, my students would go, oh my gosh, I had no idea there was so much psychology to negotiation and mediation. And I said, well, duh, it's people, you know, of course, you know, if you're going to be dealing with people in conflict then you need to understand some basics around um, the psychology of people. And so um, certainly we've, we've grown a lot in the, in the last, you know, uh, 15 years around those concepts and we see a lot more application of um, compassion and empathy and things like that in terms of how we deal with people. But here are the most recent stats available from EEOC. And um, what we can see is retaliation is our number one charge. And uh, and so this is where people feel singled out and uh, you know for those protected classes. 
And we certainly see that sort of a characteristic, unfortunately, nationally uh, on a lot of different levels, uh, but it definitely carries into the workplace. So people don't feel safe. Uh, people don't feel psychologically safe. And that's the other thing I talk about a lot. You know, since the Golden Gate Bridge, when, which is one of the first times we saw major safety initiatives that saved, you know, tons of lives, um, we haven't done very well around psychological safety in the workplace. And that I think that's really reflected in all of the, the, these levels of statistics that are going on, and, and it keeps growing. Um, I, there are some other stats that I could show the differences between the filings and so forth. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's a serious issue, and that's a lot of where I spend my time. Disability happens to be, one, like I said, one of my niche, my niche areas, and um, that has seen a major uh, increase in the last few years, and particularly as we're dealing with things like COVID-related uh, long-haul effects. Um, that comes up more and more in terms of the impact on people's ability to work and earn a living. And um, uh, so I track these kinds of things a lot to see what's going on for the people of the world, because most of us are all you know, working or employed somewhere in some capacity. And so... Um, uh, we are seeing increased resolution rates. Um, EEOC adopted a mediated approach to their complaint handling back in the 90s after the ADA was uh, implemented and really looked at the interactive process. I know I was early, an early adopter of the interactive process, which is a, a form of mediation, uh, but we are seeing better results with that kind of thing. And so Moving on from a little bit of the the, um, the brief on the brain and some of the stats driving human behavior in the workplace today, um, I want to share with you some strategies then for just how do you shift the mindset. Um, again, I'm going to share with you some resources just because I've invested a lot of my COVID time to turning uh, some of my knowledge into short videos and stuff, and uh, we use regularly in the trainings I participated in. Uh, but to give you opportunities to continue to learn, I like to say it's really important, particularly as mediators, that we are courageous enough to be curious. And then we pass that on to our, our disputants in the mediation process to encourage them to be courageous, to be curious, to learn how other people see things. And from that, uh, developing a source of options, opportunities to reach resolution and closure. So again, mediators as influencers, um, you know, we want to create that safe harbor. I, throughout my life, um, I've always done a lot of boating and uh, water activities. And, and so uh, maybe you recognize this photo. It's actually from Avalon Bay in Catalina, one of my favorite places to go, just 26 miles across the sea. Uh, but I, I use the, 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 the metaphor of a harbor because when you're out on the open sea, and, you know, you can face, you know, high winds and, and high seas, and uh, it's it's scary. I've been out there. And, uh, and so you want to duck into a safe harbor. And so that's really what we uh, as mediators want to create through our mediation process, that safe harbor. And so that people feel, do feel comfortable enough, relaxed enough, not as anxious as they might have pre-mediation to come in and be ready to, um, to engage uh, in a good faith effort in ways that can help move the parties to mediation. I also want to share with you the quote by Brene Brown up there in the upper left. I define a leader as anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and who has the courage to develop that potential. And so uh, again, I see mediators as influencers of um, moving towards uh, you know, dealing with conflict. And therefore we need to model the way you know, the psychological safety in every connection. How are we showing up? And uh, you'll see shortly, you know, a lot comes through our tone of voice, uh, more so than the words that we use. And so again, creating that a supportive environment and then fostering yes in small ways that create comfort and safety, because the more times we, we can create opportunities for our parties and conflict to say yes, it's shifting the mindset. Uh, the no comes from a different part. It tends to be more of a reactive, but saying yes is, is reaching more back into the, the higher levels of cognitive functioning. And so small ways. So one of the things uh, I've been studying over the last 10 years is this whole notion of compassion, uh, because I think we all recognize the role of empathy uh, and how as mediators, uh, the importance of demonstrating empathy uh, but like with a lot of words we have in our English language, 
Um, empathy is actually a component of a bigger picture. That bigger picture is compassion. And um, I borrow from the Dalai Lama, who in the New York Times Square speech um, uh, several years ago, uh, talked about compassion as really being nothing more than warm heartedness. And for me, that really sort of shifted uh, my mindset and my my response to that whole notion, because compassion, I think, for a lot of us can feel really like, overwhelming. It's like, I think of Mother Teresa, for example, it's like, well, ugh, I'm not I'm not going to go there, you know, entirely that direction. Um, but when he talked about warm heartedness, it really um, tapped into then showing up with care and concern, showing up with compassion, um, using our emotional intelligence so that we can't influence, uh, persuade, uh, and create an atmosphere of compassion and uh, dignity. And so it's important to keep in mind that as we try to change the disputants mindset as we try to redirect confrontations to conversations it really is an intricate uh interplay uh you know there is that arousal component you know there's a physiological response you know that dance of chemistry i mentioned earlier and this is where it's so important that we as mediators but we all as mediators also help our disputants in our mediation to shift back to the higher order of eq or emotional intelligence um and we need to help create pauses to let them to foster how they could take it back to the prefrontal cortex. And then there is this interplay of um, the different chemicals. I talked about adrenaline and how it will charge us up positively or negatively. I mentioned cortisol being our natural stress response and that too much of it can actually lead to a flooding, impeding uh, people's abilities to get out of that emotional lockdown and into the higher level of um, uh, brain functioning. Instead, we want to show up with care, concern, and compassion so that we are more effectively activating some of the other chemicals in our brain, like oxytocin, not oxycotton, okay, oxytocin. And oxytocin is what we call the brain or the love chemical, uh, you know, our feel good, I'm in love kind of thing. And, um, and, and that has a whole range of emotions that go with it. So it's not just love, but again, feeling good about, you know, what we're trying to do. And then uh, dopamine is, a, uh, we want to reinforce the reward center, you know, and so that's where I talk about, you know, acknowledging people for, for their efforts, their presence, their contributions, um, you know, their statements of, uh, you know, awareness, apology, things like that. And then two, serotonin, by slowing things down, we actually have a positive effect on serotonin, which contributes to, when too much serotonin will contribute to a higher state of anxiety. So by slowing things down and making sure that we're, we're cognizant of our tone, volume, and inflection can help create that. Pacing things, uh, let's take a break, to have a drink of water. All of that will influence how the brain uh, functioning is working so that they can shift back out of that emotional intensity that they might be feeling and back into the prefrontal cortex, the human brain. So how do we know this? Well, based on studies that actually emanate back from the 1950s, um, when there was a lot of research going on to the psychology of what happened for veterans coming out of World War II, uh, we've known this stuff for a long time, but I'm always amazed about how many times people don't know this. Uh, but 55% of how we communicate isn't what we say. It's through our, our facial expressions, our body movements, our arms. Are we looking up? Are we looking down? Uh, they mean different things. Looking up is sort of a sign of encouragement and, and positivity, hope, where if you're looking down, it's more of dejection, not despair. This isn't going anywhere. And so this is where a little study in, in body language becomes really important, I believe, for, for me to years to, to learn and understand how to read things, even on the virtual screen. You may not see that foot tapping like you might in your mediation room. My guess is you probably wouldn't anyway because everyone sits around a table, uh, usually hard top that you can't see through anyway. Um, so 55%. Why? What we see actually goes back to the back of our brain to our audio um, and occipital lobes. Then it goes back up through the brain, you know, through the uh, amygdala, through the limbic brain, back up to the prefrontal cortex. So we tend to have a physiological response to what we see before we even make sense of it, we, we naturally, that drive to survive, we fight, flee, um, or, or freeze, or fawn. And then 38%, as it says here, is through our voice, our tone, uh, our um, inflection, uh, our volume. And so again, 
things getting intense? Okay, let's let's sit back. Let's calm down. Let's and drop your voice yourself. Amazingly, the, the powerful effects that just the, the tonal quality of your voice can have. And as it says here, only 7% are the words that we use. But if we add words that tend to be uh, inflammatory on, uh, you know, like, I know, you know, oftentimes we'll talk about the, the opposing party. Well, that doesn't suggest collaboration. That's not moving people closer to reaching closure about their issues. And so, uh, but so, so words are incredibly important. And that's why, you know, I'm fostering trying to create awareness about the words that we use and how we can shift the mindset by selecting words that are less inflammatory. Uh, again, even the, the uh, saying no, or I'm not going to do that, that will tend to activate the limbic brain, which is where we have that our emotional center. And again, when we get the, emo the limbic brain going, we interfere with the ability to get back up to the prefrontal cortex to listen to what is somebody saying, okay? And this is where the mediator's uh, techniques become so important in redirecting that. Okay, I hear you saying no at this time, but what would your proposal be? What other options exist? So expanding it back in rather than shutting it down. And so... Uh, so this is what we know. And again, it gets back to how our brain is structured and how the parts of the brain that are activated along the way. Because what we've learned, and this comes from the work of Stephen Covey, is that the biggest communication problem is that we don't listen to understand. We listen to respond. And uh, I usually have some techniques I like to take people through, but just think about your own experience. If you're engaged with somebody, how many times are you actually giving them their full attention? And instead you're already busy processing your answer. And whenever I put that out there, people go, oh yeah, I see what I'm doing, yes. So listening is actually being silent. Uh, another cubbyism is seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. And so again, this is you know shifting just the whole communication pattern between people as well to focus on what is being said, and that's why again some of the skills we as mediators you know gain and apply become so important to help redirect people and um, and and to help open up their listening ability. So one of the things I, I like to say, I, I've sort of used these words already, but um, I'm going to ask you to do something with me. So see the word listen, okay? Now, a lot of people will say that that's synonymous with hearing. Well, it's not. Hearing is the audible sound. I, I Yeah, I hear you talking, but I'm not listening to what you're really saying. Or I hear that sound, but I'm not really processing or listening to what that means. And so we have a bunch of words like that, even with empathy and compassion. Uh, that sounds similar, but they're really not. And it really ties back again to the, how it's triggered in the brain. So I want you all to write down the word listen on a piece of paper in front of you. Okay. Then I want you to write down the word silent. And I asked, Take a look at those two words. And what do you notice about those two words? Now, if you've taken my training before, you probably have already know the answer. So what do you notice? Anybody? Well, I'll tell you. Listen and silent actually have the exact same words. Or letters, I'm sorry. They have the exact same letters. And so to listen, we first have to be silent. And not just what's coming out of our mouth, but also what's going on in our head. We, we, again, going back to Covey's statement, we don't listen to understand, we listen to respond. So we need to be quiet up here as well. And not everything that jumps in your head has to come out of your mouth. One thing I've learned in the work that I do with people is that when, when something does jump into your head, that's exactly what you want to not say, because it tends to come out in hurtful, harmful, and damaging ways. And so that's why our ability to slow things down and really engage people in a way to listen with full, full attention. So I use this kind of thing in my, my training programs a lot, particularly when I'm working in the workplace to help managers and leaders say, are, are you really listening to your employees? What does that mean? 
Because what I've learned about people uh, in conflict is that um, we have a natural tendency to react, again, the drive to survive. And they do tend to say things be um, before they think about what's really going on. And they also tend to take things personally. And they feel attacked uh, rather than, okay, what is this person saying and what can I learn from it? Is there some element of truth that I should take note of this? Instead, they get defensive. And in turn, they redirect the attack on somebody else. Well, you did this, so that's why I did this. Like, whoa, slow this down here. And then the last thing is that they they um, uh, respond in defense. And, and I already said this, and is they, they redirect the attack back to the other. And that's exactly what happens in retaliation then. And so being mindful of this and, again, moving away from the attacks become critically important. And this ties back to something I said earlier, you know, in terms of the influencer's mindset, um, and I'll share with you a little technique I have called the three Bs. But as um, uh, out of adversity comes opportunity. Uh, a lot of people have a fear of conflict. Um, and, but I've long said, and, and Natalie might remember this some, from back in our, some of our earlier days with Dan Dana and Craig, um, uh, also Craig Wondry from uh, Eckerd College with the conflict dynamic profile, is that you know it's conflict in and of itself is not the bad thing. It's how we manage it. And so if we can reframe conflict as an opportunity to learn, uh, then we can shift the person's mindset about conflict too. Uh, many people, a, a good third of people would rather avoid conflict than ever deal with it. And yet that doesn't resolve anything either. And sometimes we have to feel the pain in order to get that momentum, that charge to actually gain. And uh, while I wish I could say that, um, well, I did originate these, but but guess who's been saying it for years and years? Albert Einstein. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. If you take a look at the words of Einstein or Thomas Edison, you know it's out of our failures that we've we've um, learned and, and actually made uh, you know, significant discoveries. And so sometimes it has to be painful in order for us to move on. So one of the things I'll share with you, it's called the three Bs, and. Um, Again, uh, I, I use COVID to turn a lot of my techniques into short little videos because I was, you know, wasn't seeing people. And so I thought, well, this is a good instructional way. But the three Bs um, uh, is a way of teaching people to just be in the moment, just, just sit in the moment, not even analyze what's going on, but just notice what you, you're experiencing. And, and this goes back to what I said earlier, you know, that gut you know, that pit in the stomach, that rapid heartbeat, that shallow breathing, the brain freeze. What's going on for you physio physiologically? Because that's their first indication that they're triggered in some way. And so this is where, you know, when we slow things down uh, and, and engage them in some, some calming activities in the beginning can be very helpful for, for preparing them for, for the you know, getting further into the mediation. Now, this is where I use my pre-mediation, where I work one-on-one -on -one with people so I can sort of assess where they are and, and then apply some strategy. Then the second B is breathe through the moment. The power of deep breathing, folks, don't underestimate it because we all breathe, but quite frankly, we oftentimes don't breathe in ways that actually serve us well. And that's where the shallow breathing and the ten tendency for panic attacks comes is that they're not getting enough oxygen. So breathe through the moment. And again, I have a four by six technique, um, breathing six times or four times, uh, six times a day to get into the habit of them. And it has a lot of powerful uh, internal physiological effects. And then the next B is break free from the moment. Because by doing the deep breathing, it, calm, it slows us down. It slows the brain activity down. And then by breaking free from the moment, I want you to visualize, you know, how you want to walk out of this mediation room. How do you how do you want to bring closure to this? How do you want tomorrow to look like, knowing that this conflict is behind you? And so visualization takes us back to the prefrontal cortex. And so that's where we can break out of the, the emotional strangle in the limbic brain and get them back into the prefrontal cortex. And so this is a very simple technique. You can walk somebody through it very quickly. And again, I have a little video um, and short on, on my YouTube channel that you can go watch and apply it to yourself. My, my stuff is free for you guys to use. And, and I just put together the things I've learned that have worked well for me um, in my practice of dealing with people and conflict. And most of my I'll just acknowledge though too, most of my uh, employment mediation is less legally based, although I've done a lot of Title VII mediations, but it 
tends to be more relationship based. People are just not getting along. Um, and there could be some potential for a, a claim under the protected classes. But well, I, I really advocate trying to get an early start on relationship difficulties. And so I, 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 I go reduce tension and improve retention um, because people leave. And this stat's been around for, since 1998 from the Department of Labor. Um, they did a very exhaustive study looking at why do people leave good organizations? And as they got into it, even though people may have given lots of you know valid reasons like better pay, better opportunity, promotion, you know, relocation, what really drove those, them to even seek it was they had unresolved conflict in their workplace, particularly with their immediate supervisor. And so that's why I really stress early intervention. Um, um, and we use mediation then as a tool uh, at, for the specific relationship, but oftentimes it's the broader context of the team uh, environment as well. So yours to take. And also then want to share with you, um, one of my early works was your emotional potential, how you show up matters. And so uh, that goes back to you know our presence as mediators, as influencers. And so this is an ebook available on Amazon. And uh, just so you know, all all the proceeds are uh, um, donated to Kids Managing Conflict. I'm really invested in that program to help change uh, the world for the kids coming forward. And so I um, uh, encourage you to take a look at that. Give it away as a gift to your your clients. And then um, you know what we. You know, I saw, talked about earlier our fear-based mindset going into mediation, dealing with the dispute, dealing with the conflict. And again, I see our role as mediators as shifting from that fear-based mindset, you know, to being open to exploring, um, not even understanding, but acknowledging where other people are coming from and learning from that experience to generate new options. And that's really the the, the hallmark of collaboration. It's not, it's not compromising. I'll give up something if you give up something, but instead of collaborative, I hear what your concerns are, what your needs are. What ideas do I have for you? And then in turn, what ideas do you have for me? And so as we talk about that experience based, um, we want to go to connection based. And I draw upon the, the words of Theodore Roosevelt, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's where as mediators, by showing that, that uh, more compassionate side of this, um, even in tough legal disputes, uh, will help shift the the um, parties in conflict to a, a better mindset so that they can be open to uh, in identifying, engaging, exploring, you know, opportunities for closure. And I don't have the slide here, but I, I, I'll share with you another one I like to use is from, um, you know, our, our Nobel poet laureate, uh, Maya uh, Angelo, and um, and uh, uh, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so that's another powerful one that I encourage you to do. So I want to say um, thank you. We've got time for some Q and A, uh, and here are some resources that I want to share with you. I post regularly on LinkedIn um, a lot of articles and things like that, but. Um, I put here, you can you can get this uh, video series on my YouTube channel. You don't have to subscribe, um, but you can get the series there as a resource to continue learning. And they're really short. They're like two or three minutes. And so I invite you to um, uh, use those resources. They're there for you. And uh, as I conclude here, you know, uh, let's connect. And, and having that sense of connection, again, is a way of shifting uh, the brain in order to shift the mindset. And um, not only yourselves, but with your clients. Learn and grow with curiosity and courage. And uh, you have to be courageous to be curious, and you have to be curious enough to be courageous and uh, share your experience. So if you liked what you've got today, I would love to hear from you. And so let me know. And uh, uh, again, I've been delighted to be here with you and uh, share and please contribute to the Maui Food Bank. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Um, I will implement uh, some of these things in my upcoming mediation sessions. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Dupree? Certainly, you must have something. Here. <laughs> yes, it's an opportunity. It's great here. Um, here's one here um, in the chat. You mentioned Title VII cases. Is the Title VII case count trending up? 
I didn't see that on your metric slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Great question. I, I took off some slides that I'd used at the uh, presentation that Jean had seen before, just for the interest of time. Um, uh, yeah, overall, you know, you know we, we continue to see an upward tick uh, at the EEOC level as far as filings and complaints. And, um, uh, and so these complaints, you know, like we talked about retaliation and disability and so forth, retaliation can cover a number of the different projected classes, um, you know, uh, and I'll have to say, as much as I work with them, I always forget one or two, but it's like, you know, it's a race, ethnicity, religion, uh, age, um, sex, uh, disability. That's six. There's one more, and I'm not remembering what it is. Uh, that's another thing about the brain, by the way. We really only do best with two or three things to keep in mind. And if we go beyond five, you're probably not going to remember, even though I use it all the time. So the different types of uh, discrimination claims, um, you know, can range across those t seven uh, areas. Um, what we see is disability has got the greatest one. If you go back to the slide, you'll see, you know, sex and things like that are, are lesser. You know, certainly race and ethnicity used to be much more significant um, as, a, as a class of, of discrimination. But um, again, that's with diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts, we've seen that come way down. Um, but that medical, you know, people with medical conditions, and I, this is an, a change in words I'll just share with you that, you know, I've been working in the field of disability even before the ADA, working with employees with medical conditions in the workplace. But, you know, the thing is, a lot of people don't view themselves as disabled. And so that's another, you know, it's better than handicapped. Okay, that's a really old word. Um, but but disability doesn't quite capture it either because in today's world, a lot of us will develop, I mean, almost every one of us will develop a medical condition that may or may not affect our ability to work. And so um, I myself use the word medical conditions in all my work rather than disability, um, because in particular, like in the aftermath of COVID, um, we have all kinds of new medical conditions we didn't deal with before. Uh, I've been in that area of work for over 30 years, and I have never seen so much change um, in the type of case I mediate, as well as the, the, um, uh, the changes in laws. Okay, so yes, there's definitely an uptick, and it's something to really watch. And uh, now, even now, with you know the business world mandating people to come back to work full time, that's generating a whole new slew, slew of complaints as well for a variety of reasons. Yeah, yeah. So I see another one. Um, the two Bs. Um, it, it, it's a uh, be in the moment. So be in the moment's the first one. Breathe through the moment, and then break free from the moment. So in, through, and from. Sort of like our, you know, in mediation, we, we, we need to understand the past just long enough to under, recognize the impact in the present to then use that information to make good decisions for moving forward. We can't go back and change the past, but we need to understand what happened enough so that we can work with how are people impacted today and then to take them through to, okay, how do we resolve what's been happening today in ways that this doesn't keep happening? As a mediator, um, do you have any special lines, for lack of a better word, but phrases that you use to calm people down, um, you know, to kind of bring them back to center and like take a breath? Okay, let's take a minute. Uh, here you, you know, uh, you want to vent? Let's take five minutes to vent and then we'll mm -hmm. decide. But do you have any special phrases you use to help center people? Uh, thank you for asking, Jean. Um, I, I I do. I, I guess I maybe should make a list of those uh, and capture them more effectively. Um, so again, I'll, I'll just go back to you know, my pre-mediation. This is where I'll introduce people to some basic techniques. And even in my, you know, as I introduce them to mediation and I open up my mediation session, I'll acknowledge that, you know what, sometimes we actually have to experience more pain about what's happened before we're ready to move forward and gain. So I'll, I'll shift that, but I, you know, that little phrase I used before. So that way I'm preparing them that, you know what, things might get tough here. And so um, I'll, you know, I'll remind us to do some things like, you know, let's just all sit back for a moment, because even just sitting back changes the body structure and opens up the diaphragm. And let's just take a couple of breaths. Let's just process what's being said and uh, give ourselves a moment, even, even directing people, let's just all take a, got a cup of coffee or, you know, a, a glass of water. Let's all just take a, you know, a sip. Because again, that physical activity of doing that, 
actually redirects it to the motor control centers, which are on either side of the limbic brain. And so by, by engage, let's everyone stand up. Uh, let's go walk outside for a few moments. Um, drop a pen, and then that just the, the noise and your action of picking up the pen off the floor, for example, again causes their brain to redirect to the motor control centers, which gets them out of the limbic brain. So um, I'll tell you what, I will put together some of the phrases uh, that I, I, I come up with. I think that's a good idea. But you know, there are these little techniques. It's not rocket science, but little techniques if we know what to do. There are little ways to redirect um, the mindset of, of those involved. Yes, absolutely. Here's another question in the chat. Thank you for that. Before we move on. Um, if it takes 24 to 72 hours for psychology, or no, physiology, excuse me, to recover from an emotional experience, does that mean that when we have to shut down a mediation because emotions are running too high, should we not reconvene for three days? Often we take a 20 minute break, then go back at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, great question. You know, um, uh, I oftentimes will check in with the parties. You know, we've got some options here. You know, uh, you know, many times shorter breaks like the 20 minutes will be very good to help people sort of get out of the intensity of the moment and they're ready to come back in. Um, but that doesn't mean that they still aren't physiologically reacting uh, to that. So um, may I, I might ask is that, you know, we could, you know, we could conclude right now with the agreement that we're going to reconvene and what would be ideal if we could do it within 72 hours, but with Depends on schedules, but we definitely want to want to try to do it within two weeks. Um, so there's some uh, physiology that goes into those timing sequences. Uh, if we go too far out, then people sort of forget their attachment to what happened in the session, and so then we're having to sort of rebuild what's going on. Um, so you know, short breaks, longer breaks, interrupting the process rather than just hammering at it uh, is is better physiologically. Um, I know in the Navy model that I worked with for 20 years as I mentored mediators, um, you know, we always, of course, you know, did the opening, we did the agenda setting. We actually always did a joint session and that's what was required. But then we went into caucus and um, I really learned to love that model because it gave me an opportunity after hearing everybody's story to then really work with each of the parties about how I could shift them even further and, and help them craft proposals that they could bring back to the table. Talk about, you know, getting the employer to say an apology, for example, you know, or the employee for that matter, and then coming back. And we often, using that model, we were oftentimes able to um, uh, you know, reach agreement within six hours, although you know, like the one I had, we were there till nine o'clock on a Friday night. Um, but be, be giving them that caucus break after the joint session allowed people to, to um, you know, calm down and, and I would give them directions about what I wanted them to think about to come back to the joint session. So there's no fast and hard rule here, but again, I, I'm trying to educate you as far as what we know physiologically. It can take as much as 72 hours for that that charged up state, you know, that emotional intensity to slow back down. Uh, doesn't mean that they're not capable of decision-making, but if we try to hammer at it in those moments of emotional intensity, there will be emotional decision-making because we do make decisions in emotional moments, but they're oftentimes not well-balanced, okay? They, they don't have that solid cognitive component to them. And so we wanna try to avert that, I believe, as our ethical responsibility as mediators um, to um, you know, make good balanced decisions not a rash emotional decisions. Sounds good, thank you. Stephen Kramer, you posted something very interesting here in the chat. Why don't you unmute yourself and tell us one of your techniques? I have an 80 pound tortoise uh, that lives in the backyard. She lives in a 10 foot deep hole and she comes up and eats grass every day. She actually mows my lawn. I only mow once or twice a year. But I take, I, there've been a couple of times when things are getting kind of tense and I'll take, you know, the party out back to meet Shelly and you know she, she's huge you can pet her head and feed her a cactus pad or something and and it it resets them you know I had one case that the guy looked out the back an insurance adjuster and he goes what's that you know and I explained and uh he goes I gotta meet her and I and they were this close and I said not until the case settles <laughs> and within a few minutes the case settled and he got out went out to meet Shelly <laughs> wow. I love that, Steve, because what you did is that you you uh, used Shelly um, to feed the reward system. 
you know, uh, increasing their dopamine, opening them up for, for resolution. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will share with you, um, I was telling at the parties earlier that um, my dog of 14 and a half years just passed away, but I would bring her in and or show with, with I would always, you know, have a slide or, you know, have a picture or I'd actually bring her in and we'd say, well, meet, meet Snickers, you know, and, and some of these people would, have, you know, let her, you know, sit, can she sit on my lap because that would keep them calm. Yeah. And on so that note, those techniques. Yeah. Yeah. Great notes, whether we have a Shelly or Snickers or whoever, whatever uh, you have. Yes, uh, Steve, one comment and then it's the top yeah, of the hour. And we're finished. The technique about how you're going to feel tomorrow. I didn't know there was a name for it, but it, it works. I mean, when cases are close, I sometimes say to the party, how, think how you're going to feel tomorrow. You know, if they just need to move a little bit and mm -hmm. uh, think how good it'll feel. This is over, you know, you know, and, and it, it is really effective. Yeah, I no, it definitely is. Yep. 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 Very good. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dupree. Thank you everyone for being here. Next uh, week, same time, same place, uh, different uh, Zoom link. Sign up now and make your donation if you can and let us know. And it's great to be here with you. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.